thank you all for um, for coming. Finance Committee meeting January 22nd, 4 o'clock. Um, public comment from anybody that's not otherwise here for other business. Seeing none, uh, we have minutes in our package. Have everybody had a chance to look at them or would you? Okay, uh, would you just speak into the microphone and we'll record them and we'll make the... Um, the turn, turn the microphones on. Push oh, the little button. Make sure you're right. On. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> the one change is um, I looked up the rights of way on the state of Massachusetts and what my comment at the meeting was wrong, so you can take it out. When I said that the bicycle, who, had the, who has the right of way, bicycle versus car? I looked it up for the state of Massachusetts after the meeting. My comment was wrong, so please delete it. Who does have the right of way? The smaller one. The pedestrian. Basically the smaller of the two. I mean, the, to summarize. Okay. So either a person or a bicycle as versus a car. Right. Was that on the January or December? Oh, dear. I think that was December. Okay. Um, and you had another comment? Yes, and the second comment was, um, hold on a second, I'm going to put on my glasses. Oh, the bicycle was January 7th. And then also on January 7th, uh, our, the discussion on Article S, and it says the rationale behind this is that the town is overwhelmed and understaffed. The rationale in the article, not my personal opinion of that the town is overwhelmed and understaffed. Thanks, Terry. Great. Thank you. That's it. Um, with those changes, um, motion to approve the uh, minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none, thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Um, so we're going to go through some uh, budget discussions. We're going to start with the public schools with uh, Superintendent Cozart and his team. It's always an, an illuminating uh, exercise. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, we'll talk water and airports. Uh, is that okay for airports and water in terms of the schedule? Nobody's going to run out. We're going to try to be done by 6 o'clock. So. Okay. Mike? Are you ready? Yep. Okay. So thank you, um, Chairman Worth and uh, members of the Finance Committee. Um, I'm going to take you through a PowerPoint that will give you some background information. I know you've had a copy of this PowerPoint to look at, and you've also got all of the, the budget backup. Um, the, the first thing that we always start with is the enrollment. And this is a look at the enrollment since 2010. Um, just quickly, you can see that we've gone from 1289 um, up to 1686 this year. All of these numbers are October 1st, which is the um, date that the state requires us to submit. And I think it's enlightening to, to see that we've had 400 students added to the public schools in really what's a short amount of time and in a small um, school district. The last column is 2019 and 20. That is a projection um, based on um, a roll forward method, but also anticipating certain grade bumps um, like first grade and ninth grade. Ninth grade being when the private school students enter in, in, in many cases. The next slide is um, another look at enrollment. I've, I've used this for um, quite a few years, a 20-year look at enrollment in the public schools, again with October dates. And um, there are a lot of ways to look at that. Um, certainly if you look, uh, I came in 2010-11, <clears throat> and the numbers before that had decreased for four years. And, and in that time, in the time that I've been here, they've increased that 400 that I referenced before. In addition, the demographics have shifted remarkably. We know that, but when you see this slide, I think it really brings that home 
just how significant that is. Um, been a lot of changes in the last 20 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, and it marks the most dramatic change. Um, those changes, those demographic changes, present challenges, clearly, as we try to um, educate our ELL population, English language learners, um, but it also provides opportunities in our district and a richness of diversity that we experience today. The next slide starts to break the population down by subgroups. Again, ELL stands for English Language Learners. Over the years, you will have seen other acronyms, ESOL, English Speakers of Other Languages, um, ESL, um, and I'm sure in, in the next year or two that will change. But you can see that in 2005-06, we had a total of 33 ELL students in our district. Um, again, when I arrived in 2010, we had 100. And today, we have 286 um, ELL students. Now, that doesn't account for ELL students who have FLEPT, and that means former LEP. And so there are also quite a few students who have rolled out of those ELL services but are still in our school district. And please, please stop me at any point if you have questions, and I'll certainly take questions at the end as well. This is our special ed population over the last um, nine years. Um, a little bit of a dip. We, we actually um, have to look into that 2015-16 because um, Michelle Brady and I are not sure that that number is accurate. That is the number on the state website, um, but we, we look at that a little bit skeptically. Um, so this year we have 245 students and across the district with uh, the larger number now being at the high school. And then um, the next slide just shows our um, budget <clears throat> figures for last year, um, 28, 686, 642, and the budget going forward in the next year, um, 2020 budget at 3136, 642. Mike, would you just go back to Please, sure. Go, go back, Jen. So is the, um, the high school numbers have gone up, but it doesn't look like it follows from well, school. Is there, a, is there just a jump? So you, new students entering the schools that have? There, there are a couple of factors at play. Of course, you can see that when NIS came on board was 2017 and 18. And so we jumped from 75 students to 125 students covering that same range. Um, some of that is earlier identification, um, new subpopulations of children with special needs. Certainly the, the largest growing population is probably um, children on the autism spectrum, and, and that's a very broad spectrum. The high school numbers, um, you'll see them in the 70s, 80s, a uh, peak of 92 in 16, 17, and then back down um, going up. Every year, a group of seniors graduate, or another aspect is that sometimes students um, depart services even though they stay as students. I don't know if that answers your question, David. No, I think it does. It's just you <coughs> expect that coming up from, you know, the group coming into high school would make a contribution to this number. Of, uh, but they just well, you've got kids rolling in and rolling out. Yeah, that's what I'm Right, yeah. right. Right. So yes, you have four grade levels, but it's really uh, incoming eighth graders and departing seniors, and that is the factor that it will grow or decrease by usually. 
Um, <clears throat> we do have some identification of new kids at the high school level, but if we're if we're doing our job well, most you want to identify as early as you can. And so you'd like to think that you're identifying kids and they've been receiving services for throughout elementary, middle, and high school. That said, we do get new kids moving into the high school um, all the time. Great, thank you. Yep. And this is the um, operating budget, just so that you can see as it has gone up from 2011-12 to um, the projected increase. You may remember that in last year's or this year's operating budget, the 2019, we had a um, 133,000 that was a one-time expense. Just added in. And then <clears throat> this is the next slide is one that I like to show because it really gets down to the per pupil expenditure. You can see that the state per pupil expenditure in, um, in red, as it goes up, um, it's actually gone down a little bit from 2016-17 to 17-18. Uh, and ours um, has gone down. You have to keep in mind, though, that this is also a reflection of what our enrollment is, because it's a, it's a percentage of that enrollment. So while it looks to be high in 2009-10, you, you started to see a decrease in population for a couple of years after that before the increase occurred again. Um, I've, I've covered the reasons for our per pupil expenditure being greater than the state average. We've talked about um, the challenges of an island um, school department. We don't have the advantages of participating in area vocational programs the way that you do on the mainland or collaborative special education programs the way that they do on the mainland and also our athletic budget. Those are the three um, areas that are significantly higher as you might expect. Next slide is the, um, the chapter 70 historical comparison. <clears throat> this is something that um, I'm sure the, the town uh, finance department watches um, closely and you can see that we've received um, significant increases in the last four years um, into the town coffers. And uh, they're coming up with a new formula for Chapter 70. Um, and I think that Martin will be attending a webinar later this week um, to hear more about that formula and have a better idea of what that number may be moving forward. Federal grants. We have a number of federal grants that um, supplement our budget. <clears throat> Title I is um, we use for remedial reading. The IDEA grant is the largest of the grants. As you can see there, that's the grant that we get for um, special education services. And then smaller grants, Title II is for professional development. Title III grant of 42434 is for um, based on our e ELL population. And then Title IV has just been resurrected in the past few years, and that's for safe and drug-free schools. The next two, but, um, two slides show just pie charts to show you the percentage of the budget for each school or department. Um, the elementary, the intermediate, and CPS are all about the same, and they all have about the same population. The high school population is now the largest of the four schools. And then you can see that technology is 3%, athletics 2% of the budget, and facilities about 13%. The largest part of the facilities budget 
is um, staff for cleaning all of the buildings. And the next uh, simply shows that 83% of our total budget is um, personnel and 17% for expenses. So as we go in, that's pretty typical when, if you saw the individual schools, um, it's even higher. So if I, if I showed you the slides, and I think you had them in, in actually the, the individual presentations that we gave you on each of the four schools, they're up in the 90, 95% for personnel. But then when you add in special education because of residential tuition costs, um, athletics, some of those other areas and, and facilities, they bring that percentage for the whole district down to about 83. These are the parameters that were given to the administrative team. These are based on directives provided for us by the school committee. Um, and uh, of course the uh, budget needs should be linked to the district and school goals and the plan. Um, justification of the building budgets should be based on projected enrollments. And we shouldn't have a decline in enrollment and an increase in, in staffing, for example. And we don't. Um, building principals have to identify what services are the most important um, that they want to accomplish in this budget cycle. And the school committee and administration <clears throat> are committed to making sure that we take care of um, the whole child not just the um, academic intellectual side. Um, and, and so you'll, you'll see the physical, social, and emotional development of our children. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, um, we are really challenged by the um, mental health issues that our kids are coming into our schools with. And so an increase in guidance counselors and social workers. Um, our kids are coming with a, a lot of challenges and needs, and our system has to be ready to meet those needs. Could uh, you elaborate without going into obviously somebody's personal issues? But sure. Could you expand I think, on that a little bit, please? Sure. I think, um, I think there are a lot of things that contribute to what I'm talking about, but social and behavioral issues, kids coming in who um, are, are um, socially maladjusted, um, who aren't um, paying attention to their parents, much less the educators and other people in their lives. Um, we have kids who are living independently in high school. They're not living at home. Um, and then we could list the physical needs as well, but mostly social, emotional is what I'm referring to. Thank you. And then um, we want to make sure that our budgets reflect actual expenditures. Um, Martin does a great job of giving each principal and each department head the expenditures in their line items for the past three or five years so that they can see, okay, where's the disconnect if there is a disconnect in our spending and our budgeting. And then uh, likewise, Diane O'Neill um, has been working hard to look at the um, utility expenses, fuel and electricity, trying to get a handle on you know, what we can expect from year to year. Um, that's not always easy to do in any one year, but when you trend that information over three to five years, you should have a pretty solid figure. Um, here are the increases um, to this year's budget, and you, you have them in a couple of different ways. A new computer, Mrs. Erickson. It is. If you look at the budget, it doesn't so, seem to reflect, um, maybe it shouldn't, I don't know. We added the new, you know, the new school that we built. You'd think you'd see a bump in that chart somewhere. 
where the expenses would have increased with janitors and lights? And there was in the previous year, not in not in this operating year, 1819, but you would have seen it in from um, 1617 to 1718, Cliff. Yeah, it just seems consistent. It almost seems like you've gone a million, a million, a million, a million. Oh, in the overall yeah, number. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that that would um, be a result of the fact that we had all of those students and we had most of those teachers. We simply were putting them into a new building. And with the exception of the staff for cleaning the 72,000 square feet, that was um, one big jump. And then, so I think we actually, if, if, if you looked at that, there would have been a big jump, a bigger jump from, um, 1718, I think it was 1.4 million from 1617 to 1718. Yeah. Right? And before that, it had been a million, million, million. But that 1.4 increase from 1617 to 1718 would reflect the addition of um, facilities workers, a new administrator, a school nurse, and a librarian for that new school. So as you um, look at what we're adding in this budget at NES, we've added two kindergarten teaching assistants, um, a .2 FTE, and I'm, I'm, I know you're familiar with the term FTE, full-time equivalent, so we have a .8 preschool teacher that we're going to make full-time. Adding a special education teacher, this is for the options program for those children that I was mentioning earlier who are having um, social, emotional, behavioral problems in the elementary school. At the intermediate school, we're adding a math coach to work with teachers to improve math instruction at that level and adding a social worker. And you'll see that social worker carried through. We, we actually will be moving with this budget to a social worker in, in every school. Um, so we have the social worker at NAS and we're adding one at CPS. They work with families, they work with individual students, they work with staff who are um, trying to um, handle children, manage children in the classroom. We're adding a special education teaching assistant at the middle school, a part-time vocational teacher, and I'll, I'll come back to these part-time positions when we talk about what we didn't add, um, but a, a part-time vocational teacher at uh, the middle school for technology integration, a position that we had and then moved away from because um, we, we weren't able to find the right candidate to run it, but we recognize that it is a position that we need to have um, to best prepare our children to use technology properly. A stipend for the assistant to the athletic director, um, a teaching assistant for the English language program. Those are for the, um, that teaching assistant would work with those students who are coming in with little to no English. And um, that's been an increasing population at the high school. You can imagine when they come in in the elementary school, um, I would venture to say that almost every child that comes to us as an English language learner in the elementary school graduates um, fluent in two languages and is successful. When they come to us, late in high school not speaking English, it's a far greater challenge for the classroom teacher. You know, how do you teach them biology when they don't have any English language um, skills? So um, that's, that's been a, a growing population and a growing challenge for us. Um, adding a part-time vocational teacher at the high school, we're, we're very, um, happy with the vocational program and we have a vocational program that reflects the island. We have building trades 
because building trades is a strong profession on the island. We have culinary arts, um, and that too is a, an important um, career on the island. We have a school nursing um, allied health program, and we have um, auto mechanics. And um, two years ago, we added landscaping. And all of those are a, a good fit with um, the needs on Nantucket. So we'd like to probably expand one of those. Um, I know that Dr. Bucky has even talked about maybe adding something in the hospitality field, um, which we think would be a good match with the um, local economy. And then moving to the next slide. Well, before you go yes. On, um, I'm assuming those Um, they're not. Those are um, point four positions. And if you're talking about the vocational teacher, no, all the all together, the numbers up here are just salaries. So those are salaries. Those are not um, health insurance. Yeah. So if, do you know what that percentage is, Martin? Do you know like it was around about fifty percent, forty-five to fifty percent loaded? I I would say it's a little. Less than 40, I'd say it's probably 35%, but it depends on whether they take an individual or a family. So you could you can range from um, 15,000, I'm gonna look at Brian, to 25 or north of 25 for a family. We actually, um, we use the blended average for the two family plans that we offer. So the carrying cost that we're carrying for any new Just in percentage terms, what do you, I mean, other budgets that I've looked at for the town are they're running about 48 to 50% all in costs. That's insurances, it's statutory costs, it's retirement costs. Um, I, I, it would, what, whatever the number is, I mean, I think it's important to just bear in mind that we're only looking right, at the salary. Yeah, salary costs that right. there's, and, it, and it's not the minimus the additional cost that's associated with. I would say that it's probably going to be pretty similar to what the town is experiencing, with the exception of any positions that would qualify for mass teacher's retirement would not have any retirement component to that. So that would be the only adjustment on a downward basis. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, next slide, Jen, please. In special education, we're adding a board certified behavior analyst. This is um, often referred to as just a BCBA the, by the acronym. Um, this is somebody that we contract with right now and it's very expensive contracted service and we would like to bring our own BCBA into the district and uh, that would give us greater flexibility and service. We, ha we need to increase the special education um, transportation line. We have certain mandates there. Um, increased the existing bilingual support person. We have a 10 month person. This would um, make them a 12 month person. Um, I always like to point out that school doesn't end in June anymore. Um, we have a very robust summer program for all students, but, uh, but particularly for children with special needs and ELL students, um, as well as the community school programs. And um, increasingly, we need that um, bilingual person to um, be available for the um, conversations in the summer. And then adding another 10-month interpreter translator. In facilities, we have some additions to repair maintenance, maintenance contracts, and equipment contracts, um, offset by a decrease funding for electricity at NES and a decrease funding for electricity at the high school. Um, those were things that, that Diane felt very comfortable based on those three and five year trends. And then finally in technology, um, increasing a computer technician at the high school from 10 months to 12 months 
um, some increased funding for overtime. Um, we've gone from um, computer labs to one-to-one -one computing in grades three through 12. And so there's a, an associated cost with maintaining all of that equipment. Increased funding for professional services and software. And then um, we are going to go to a central office registrar, um, one person who does the registration of new students instead of having it done at each building. So those are the things that we have um, increased. These are the things that were requested um, but were not proposed in this budget. And um, the school committee um, and the administration felt it was important to share this with FinCom. Um, in years past, we've, you've thrown us the softball is, of uh, is there anything else that we need? So I guess I'm um, putting this up ahead of time. There, they had requested four kindergarten teaching assistants so that we had an assistant in every kindergarten classroom. And um, the budget that we've presented to you only has two of those four. We had hoped for an increase in Spanish at the intermediate school. We have somebody there who is 0.4, and we wanted to go to 0.6. Um, that's the equivalent of two days a week to three days a week. Full-time vocational, this is um, that other 0.6 of the 0.4 that is in the budget. Um, and then full-time vocational teacher at the high school. If, if we had enough money, these are two positions that we would make full-time. Special Ed Administrative Assistant is we have somebody who is part-time, half-time, and would like to go to full-time. Um, an increase in the special education residential tuition line. We don't feel that we need to do that at this time. And when I go a little bit further in the um, presentation, um, I'll, I'll show you why. Additional funds for technology Hardware, I skipped the SEI coach for ELL program. Um, adding another nighttime custodian at the intermediate school, adding funding for an electrician position for facilities, and then an increase in funding for central system uh, maintenance contracts. Those are all things that were um, presented by department heads or principals to me, um, but did not make the list to present a balanced budget to you. What <clears throat> what drives the decision when you say a balanced budget? What do you, you what do you determine your budget by a percentage every year that you don't want to go over? No, um, and it's the appropriation that is presented to us by the town. So when the town tells us that the appropriation is one point four million, um, we need to meet that one point four million to present a balanced budget. The requests that we had came in at about um, 1.8, 1.9 total. Um, and so decisions have to be made at that point. OK, what are we not going to fund? Those decisions begin with conversations with department heads and principals. And we try to um, prioritize, as the town does in, in many different ways. And we felt that these. Um, weren't as high a priority as some of the things that were on the previous two slides. I, I recognize that that is um, debatable. There are valid arguments for many of the things that you see on this list, um, as there are valid arguments for some of the things that did make the list. Um, but we need to get down to that figure, unless we're looking at, o at an override. And um, the school committee um, has determined that going for an override at this point is not a smart move um, for the school system. We'll play that card if and when it's, it's most needed. So um, these are the things that were not in the proposed budget. Just moving forward, I can point a few other things out. Um, Here's the community school breakdown. 
in red you see what the appropriation has been and then in blue are the um, whoops we'll go back in blue are the um, participant fees and then in green some of the gifts and donations and grants that the community school is is trying to get we work very hard um, to try to keep those fees participant fees down because otherwise we have people in the community who really need these programs who can't participate in them so um, Tracy Roberts is the, the new director of community school she's done a great job um, you know making her budget work and um, expanding programs the next slide is um, I think one of the more interesting slides special education residential tuition um, when I arrived in 2010-11 we had um, an appropriation a budget of 478,000 for residential tuitions and circuit breaker is money that we get back from um, the Department of Education um, but you can see that our total cost that year for residential tuitions was just shy of a million um, and because the appropriate we didn't budget enough we had to make up the difference out of the operating budget because this is a required expenditure and so I, I felt and, and Glenn Field at the time felt we can't sustain that we can't rob from Peter to pay Paul can't take money that is would have been designated for other programs and other students so in 2011-12 you can see a significant increase in the appropriation um, but gradually we were able to increase the circuit breaker um, and if you can if you can work to file for the most that you can get in circuit breaker then you can bring that a, appropriation down this year we had um, 339,000 in circuit breaker and 550,000 in in the budget um, I think one thing that we can point to is that the budget has for residential tuitions has gone down in the last three years and projected in the fourth year um, and that is because we're working very hard to keep students at home we have built programs special needs programs um, most parents want their children educated in their home community and um, but recognizing that sometimes we have to um, send a student off if we can't meet their needs how many students is this for that would be um, 10 to 12 students every year a residential placement might cost 50,000 a year or it might cost two hundred thousand dollars a year and that really depends on the degree of their needs um, but there are some very expensive placements crotchet mountain for one and, and there are others um, What makes residential tuition so hard is that we can get a student enroll in our school district after the budget has been set and When that happens all of a sudden we may have if they're from out of state We may have another hundred and fifty thousand dollar tuition that we hadn't anticipated what Massachusetts allowed us to do last year was create the stabilization fund and we funded that with two hundred thousand um, dollars of money remaining at the end of last year to as a hedge into a revolver for that happening and so our our budget therefore doesn't need to add in a potential 100 or 150 thousand dollar placement so the stabilization fund has given us some security in that and what are you going to maintain in that about 200 thousand mm -hmm. i i think so cliff um i don't think that we anticipate adding any more this year if we had spent some this year because of somebody coming in then we probably would have looked at year-end funds to um 
go back into that, but um, we don't anticipate that this year. And one quick question on the community school. Does it break even or is it losing money? Um, two years ago, we had a, a tough year and they lost money and, and the um, public school has to make up that difference. Um, this past year, they did a great job, um, you know, picking that back up. There are certain programs that are um, that make money, and then there are certain programs that we accept are going to be loss leaders mm -hmm. because they're something that the island and the community needs, but they're not going to bring in a lot of money, particularly. Um, you know, programs for younger children, preschool, that sort of thing. Um, whereas, typically, driver's ed makes money for the community school, and um, summer programs, summer schools make money for um, the community school. It's sort of, I, I liken it to college athletics. Football often is, if it's really successful, makes enough money for a college to offer other sports. Mm -hmm. And so I think that happens in, in community school. So is this a football team, the community school at this point in total, or is it a uh, lacrosse team? Yeah, I, I think um, they are um, probably one of those teams that are, are breaking even. Okay. Yeah, we're not, we're not salting away money. Um, for example, when when we are making money in um, driver's ed, we know that every five years we're going to buy a new car. Right. So we we account for that so that we don't get hit in in, in for a big amount in any one year. Um, but I'd, I'd say um, pool makes a little bit. They have their head above water, so to speak, but. Um, but a lot of there, there are several programs that don't make money, and we're okay with that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so these are just some of the things that we accomplish with this budget. Um, we always try to maintain or improve class sizes. We we have done that um, in the regular classrooms. Um, we are concerned with the class sizes in some of what we call unified arts like gym and art and music. Um, some of those numbers, particularly at the middle school, are pushing uh, um, higher than we would like. That's one of the reasons we wanted the um, tech integration teacher to help mitigate those numbers. We wanted greater support for kindergarten. While we didn't add four teaching assistants, we did add two, so we're getting closer there. Um, greater support for mathematics instruction. Um, there's been a lot said and written um, that we aren't um, where we want to be with math instruction. Our ELA is pretty solid across the district, um, English language arts, but mathematics instruction um, across the district needs to improve. And, and the high school, to be fair, showed significant improvement this last year. By the time kids graduate, they're hitting the marks, but um, in the elementary and middle school, we're not where we want to be. Um, an increase in social workers that I mentioned, um, increase in support for students with special needs, uh, additional district-wide translator. We, we still have a lot of English language learners moving into the community and then more um, computer technician time to support all the one-to-one -one devices that we have. And Jen, hello, there we go. I don't know if you want us to go quickly through the Capitol or whether you're meeting with Capitol maybe tomorrow. And so I don't know if you want me to speak to any of the um, speak to the items that are getting recommended by the capital? Well, I don't, I'm not sure that I exactly know that, but I, I think I know that, and um, so sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we'll just go through them quickly. Go through them. Yeah. Yep. The first is um, $300,000 for building improvements. 
that's something that we put in almost every year. We have buildings that um, need to be maintained. That might be the facade. It might be the roof. It might be um, floor tiles in classrooms, um, any number of, of projects. Um, go ahead forward for me, please, Jen. Here are some examples of windows that need painting and cabinets in the elementary school that need to be replaced and, and floor tiles. Um, that's every year in one or more of our schools. And is there a reason, Brian, uh, Brian why we, these are capitalized and not expensed? Um, the main reason, quite frankly, is so that articles stay open. If we just funded this in the budget, we theoretically <coughs> Large amounts and reserve them for no purpose other than to carry them out of COVID. Encumbrance is a year end or supposed to be tied to something that's already started or going to be started in a very short term. So, well, no, it's the reality. The capital article is the way to be able to do the repairs over a long period of time. Yeah, but they're not capital expenses. I mean, that's the issue. Well, it depends on what it is, I guess. Well, so, Excuse me, but painting and fixing windows is not a general maintenance. It's not very expensive. I mean, if we're doing it because we don't have enough money in our operating budget, it's the way you speak to it. It's the way that it's been done, and if the painting is over $50,000, it's a capital expense according to our financial policy. So, so an example would be um, there was an ex a capital expense for the roofs. And we spent, um, I think it was, might have been $200,000 six years ago. And we still have 50000 left in that, um, in that capital that we haven't spent. But we know that we will on a repair for that at some point. The next slide is the Bacchus Lane playing fields and playground phase three. Um, been a lot of, of talk about this. We haven't been able to get it um, underway. Uh, a little frustrating. It was um, sort of hung up in land bank and then land court. Um, but I've been led to believe that it will be, it's on the docket at land court and will be out um, soon and we'll be able to move forward. That's building a playground on the um, on the right side there and then adding moving the baseball field from where it is now behind the high school to um, the Bacchus Lane fields and then a parking lot there. Going forward and then <clears throat> excuse me this is a central office addition. Um, this is the teen center. We're doubling the teen center in size. Um, ooh, we have a typo there. Okay. Um, we are bringing special education back out of the elementary school to the, um, to the central office and bringing ELL program out back to the central office. And that will allow us um, by September 2020 to have universal preschool. And that's preschool for all fourth grade, uh, four year olds. Um, looking forward to that. All of the research supports um, certainly that the earlier we can get children into school and, and um, begin teaching them that the, the growth over time is significantly more. And then campus-wide radio replacement, um, a campus-wide master plan. I'd, I'd like to talk about the master plan just a little bit because um, something, you know, that the school district and the town really needs to think about is the next school. And I know that it, it makes people nervous when we've just spent 45 million on a new school. But someday, if, if we want to have, um, when we need another school, if you want to keep it on the campus, which has been my understanding of what the community wants, 
we should be looking at available land that's contiguous to um, our site. And I think it's, it's going to be important before we just stick a football field or a new turf soccer lacrosse field, um, we should be thinking about where a new school might go because you don't want to put that in and then five years from now say, uh-oh, that sh really shouldn't have gone there. So there needs to be some thinking about what is the plan for five years out, 10 years out. Um, and less enrollment slows down, the community is going to be thinking about a new school sooner rather than later. And then finally, um, I think there was a request, and I'm not sure that this is will be funded by capital because the funding mechanism is still being examined by Brian and, and Capcom. Um, but we feel that the community should be setting $500,000 a year aside. This is something we've talked to FinCom in previous years. Um, so that you, the town has a fund to pull the trigger if a um, property becomes available. Um, because if you, if you don't, it could be gone for 20 years, 50 years. Um, and, I, and I don't believe that the school district or town should enter into uh, eminent domain. I think that that makes for bad neighbors um, and just upsets the community. But if, if we can get first right of refusal on some of the properties that are close to um, our existing facilities, it would be a smart move. Did we not vote for an appropriation for to buy some of these properties in here a couple of years ago? We, we, um, we did, Cliff. Um, So here is um, here's Surfside, yep. right? Yep. And this property right here, um, it was Gail Charette's property, if you recall, and she was very nervous about a, a school going into her backyard. Yep. And the um, school and town entered into an agreement. So that may be what you're what you're thinking about. And I thought Murray's old property, or whoever owns it now, in between the ball field, behind the teen center. Right. Now, that's Kaiser's. Kaiser's. Um, and if that property ever became um, available, that would be, I think, a critical property for the school district to own, um, as would any of these properties if they ever become available. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you look at this, making all of that school property, you have a lot more options when it comes time to building a new school. Um, you could build the you could build a school here. You know, in fact, we talked about building the intermediate school here at one point and didn't want to give it up. And and I love the way I was I was one of the skeptics about this, but I love the way that it it worked out. And I think the architects did a great job of having those two schools face each other um, and a safe space in here for all students. Um, but you can build a school here or you might even build it here behind the um, where the baseball field is. There are lots of different possibilities, but you don't, that's why I'm saying you don't want to build an athletic complex and then three to five years later say, uh-oh, we shouldn't have done it. So that, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Superintendent Kozark? Superintendent, I believe this will be your last presentation to the Finance Committee, correct? It, it will be. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank yes. You. Great. Thank you. Anybody from the school board that's here that wants to say anything? Okay. Yes? I just, I just have one comment. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the request for additional resources, 
if you look at the total of the 1685 number of students, right, and you count in the ELL and the special education, you have 30% of the entire school population being in one of those two groups. You, you do, but you have to be careful because some children are in both. Both, sure. So you, but you're right. Sure. It's, it's so if you, in terms of the resources that the schools have to, I, I think that that presents a great challenge in the classroom. And in, when I look at all the requests for additional staffing, the things you took and some of the things that were on the list that you didn't, didn't take, I would just really strongly urge you <laughs> to consider staffing to support those areas because I think it affects all the kids. And I think that that's probably the number one priority we have as parents and people who you know, want to support a strong school system and also to support the increasing, you know, ha helping kids do better in math. I think the more support we can give those groups, then it gives everybody in the classroom a chance to be more successful. I, I appreciate that, and I think if you look at our increases, we did try to do that. Um, I would absolutely agree with you that um, the spectrum in a classroom used to be here, and by that I mean the, the spectrum of needs of a group of students. So you had 20 students who might have been like this. Today, that spectrum is this, if that makes sense to you. It has grown both with ELL and special needs, and I think it is very hard to ask a teacher to differentiate for all of the different needs. That's my point. Yes. That's so my I point. I appreciate that. I mean, I have two children in the school system, and I think that they, you know, have enjoyed really wonderful education so far, but I think this is a real challenge in their experience and the other kids in their grades' experience. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. Appreciate all the hard work you have done and your team has done, and uh, as usual, uh, another excellent job, so thanks very much. Thank you, all thank you. of you guys out there. Okay. <laughs> At least you brought your own sharing your section. Closer to you. 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 Wow, there goes, half, there goes our audience. <laughs> yeah. Mark, they don't want to hear what you have to say, I guess. Well, they're leaving <laughs> on <okay>. you. <laughs> Next time, have school go last so that it means it's full. Um, So, um, if I may indulge my committee for a moment, um, I think there are probably a couple of things that are pretty important for us to understand, and probably the first is what are the implications, uh, longer-term implications of the Water Management Act, yeah. and how potentially is that driving decision, decisions that you all have to make, and uh, maybe and maybe there's no impact, which it would well, be fine. Is. But uh, uh, I think that would be helpful to understand, and then maybe that fits a little bit more into the context. So where we stand with the water withdrawal permit is we were supposed to have that in place, I think, back in 2015 or 16. Uh, they requested additional information in 2016 regarding a new mitigation plan that the state came up with <coughs> to enhance the ability for Cape and Islands communities or seasonal communities, maybe on the North Shore, South Shore of Boston, to pump more water during the peak seasons. Uh, so we gave them that information. It included uh, land owned by land bank conservation, um, anything that's locked up. For every acre, you could get so many gallons extra to pump on your permit. Well, we were the first town in the Commonwealth to submit a mitigation plan. So they still have that, and they're still reviewing that. Uh, we have email documentation from Mass DEP that says they are working on the permit as fast as they can. I think as of last month, there were three or four towns in the Commonwealth that have actually received their permits. 
So right now we're currently working off our old permit that was renewed in 2016 or updated in 2016 for the new well on Pulpus Road. Uh, we do have email confirmation from DEP that any exceedances over that uh, will not be punishable by any fines or, or anything like that. Um, they just ask that we keep them informed, which we have, so every time there's a new development or a new, a new extension, so when we talk about growth and development, it's not always new like the, the one out by the wastewater plant or Old South Road. Uh, a good example is Green Meadow. Uh, over by Miles Reese's old shop off Surfside. They were never, they've never had water. Uh, sewer was just installed. Uh, there's a lot of water quality issues in the private wells there. So they came in as a group and talked to the commission to put water into Green Meadow while the, while the uh, sewer was going in. So that, that's one of the things we're trying to get done. So that information is also passed on to DEP who's trying to do our permit based on size of the water system, the population, which they had uh, way off. They had us, I think, for close to 30,000 in the summer, 28,000. And based on new information that came out this summer from Worcester Polytech, uh, you know, that, that number is closer to 50 or 60. Uh, the winter population, they had us at about 7,000. Uh, I don't know what the real number is, but I'm guessing it's pushing closer to 15. 12 to 15,000, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so we had to give them that information to update it. So they are still in that process. And that really, as you're, you're aware, um, it, it tells us what we can pump per day. So it, it has a big effect on what we're trying to do. And the longer it goes, the harder the decisions become. Right. Have you gotten to a point where you've ever had to ration? Water? No, there, there is no moratorium set by DEP to say, you know, until you get your permit, you can't do any new services until, okay. you know, there is no, there is nothing like that. There is a drought management act that's part of that permit that is in effect, that there's a well off of Russell's way that's not affected by any of our pumping, so it's an ambient well under normal conditions. When the depth to groundwater in that well reaches a certain, certain number, then we have to limit outside water use, which... It hasn't happened in, I think, the last 16, 17 years. So do we have take, lots of water. Do they take in consideration, seeing we just looked at the population of the school? Yes, so um, all that information has been okay. forwarded over, and it's great when we get to see information like that. I'm actually glad we were before those guys, because that's interesting stuff. And, and we see that as well, just in our pumping. Uh, we. We do pump more and more every year for the new connections that are going in. And it's also dealing with uh, house lots that were always one are now two, three, and sometimes six, depending on how it's subdivided. Uh, so all that information has been passed on to them. But I think the real holdup with the permit is the mitigation piece where to determine how much above the permit, they're, they're hoping it to be within 10 or five to 10% above your daily permit. And what they do and set precedents here for, for Nantucket and in the Cape uh, is going to be open for the whole state to use. So people up in the Charles River Basin and Ipswich River stress basins will have the ability to do what we're doing. And I think that's why they're really thinking about how they're going to do it. Okay. Great. But I hope that, I, yeah. Dave, I no, I think that's that a, soon. helpful to have that as the backdrop. So. Just one more question about, um, I, I've been attending the uh, 40B meetings yeah. and stuff. They had a doctor, I guess he was a doctor, or a lawyer, something like that. And he talked about the um, different places like Key West, Florida, mm -hmm. how they go down there and they um, make a judgment on what capacity a, a, a municipality can, can get to before the water quality or the water right. volume is, is right. jeopardized. Is that, I know we go through tons of information, mm -hmm. is that something that we have or they make us do in Massachusetts? It is. We, we actually, we're very fortunate in that we have done a ton of geophysics and a ton of drilling and, and we have a lot of science to back what we have underneath us in our aquifer. Okay. Uh, actually part of this year's budget, a $95,000 increase in professional services, is to look at what's called a, a pump-out analysis. So we'll take the rate study 
turns into an asset management program, turns into, all right, with the system that you have, with the capital plan we have, what's the magic number ballpark range of how many more connections before you have to do something like another tank or much bigger pipe or another well? So that, that's a portion of where that's coming from. But we do have a lot of information, and the state understands that. That's why they're allowing us to do the mitigation, because we understand the aquifer we have. Right. And do they, do they, do they have a, uh, I guess I'm looking for the uh, stress on the aquifer period. I mean, I, I guess we, it goes by so many gallons, but is it by so many people and so much of a population, yes. so much of a square foot area? When does it jeopardize the quality of the water? I guess I'm looking for. That's a, that's also part of it. Yeah, and we, and we do know that, and we're very lucky that our aquifer is separated separated into a few different lenses. So where we pump from Wanacom, it's public water supply wells. Uh, there are two in the upper aquifer that is really unprotected, so it's affected by surface water runoff, storm water collection. Uh, but the majority of our water is pumped from 150 feet, and we have a confining layer that protects that from the above. Uh, we had it dated. Woods Hole did some work. It's ancient glacial water, about 14,000 years old. So it's really quality, quality stuff. But there is a per capita number that uh, the state, for unassessed basins like us, they like it to be under 90 gallons per person. When you start getting into the 110, 105, then, then that's when the issues you're talking about Right. They, I thought, I thought we, that's where we were about 120 gallons a person. No, is that no, right? we're no? we're closer in the we're in the 80s. Are we? Okay. Yeah. Right. So why don't you take us through your proposal for the next fiscal year? Okay. So when we look at the overall budget for Wanna Comet in 2020, uh, we had a projected revenue increase of about four uh, percent. That's mainly going to be from water use fees you know, water being used. Uh, when we looked at new service connections, there's been a lot of indicators of a slowdown or not a shutdown, but maybe this might be the crest. <laughs> and we looked at that and talked to a lot of, a lot of the, the local surveyors and the masons, who are usually the first guys to the job sites. And they do, they do see somewhat of a slowdown, not a stop, but their lists, the bottom of the list isn't coming in as fast as it used to. So, for example, in this year, the 2019 budget, we, we projected a, 100 new connections. We're just a little over halfway through the year, and we're at 56 new ones in the ground so far for 19. So for the, the 20 budget, we're projecting 75 new connections, thinking that maybe we didn't want to get caught in a place where if there is uh, some kind of economic slowdown, that we were there. Also in there, there's... Uh, Two, two major changes to some line items. Uh, there's a $160,000 increase to the inventory line on the budget. That's gonna come out of retained earnings. Uh, that is to start our meter replacement. Uh, the newer meters now that we're using, when they get to the age of 15 to 20 years, the batteries in those start to wear and die. Um, and they also start to lose a little bit of accuracy. Uh, we looked into battery replacement and by the time you do the replacement and look at the uh, accuracy factors, it makes much more sense to actually start replacing the meters that are in that age range. So that's what that line item for the extra 160 for inventory would come to, to buy maybe 150 meters. They're about 1000 bucks a piece. And uh, get those in and, and start doing that. And that would probably be every three to five years we might do that. Or we're, we're planning on doing that. The other increase, and a, a major increase in one of the line items, was the 95000 for professional services. Not only to complete the rate study that I know last year at this time you guys had wanted us to do that. We're 90% of the way done. GZA was over about a month ago to, to go over the tool they're creating for us. Uh, it's a powerful tool. We'll be able to take this whole budget, next year's budget, and put in capital, put in anything we want and it's going to show us how it affects the rate and it'll highlight ways that we can not change the rate and maybe other pieces of the budget that we can work with to adjustment to make adjustments um, I was I was really hoping to have that for you now but it's looking like uh, I heard from him today maybe two or three weeks we'll have that done 
uh, the 95,000 is to take that and get a, a better asset management program than we have currently. We're using our, uh, our geo database through the GIS system. But uh, we're going to upgrade that and make it a more manageable tool. And then also we're working with uh, the sewer department with David and uh, DPW with Rob are both trying to build their GIS systems up to what we have. And we had a great meeting out in David's shop and he had some consultants come over and they have a thing called the GIS dashboard, which is a live interactive GIS that we can all share. Since we're planning on doing a lot of projects together, uh, starting probably in March, we're going to do the first project together with water, sewer, and stormwater in the North Liberty area. Um, that allows us, so when we go out, we have our own, all of our own survey equipment. So we'll go out, and if we do a new service or extend a water main, we do the survey, come back to the office, put it into AutoCAD, convert the AutoCAD into GIS, and our database is automatically updated. This would allow those guys to see those updates. Since we're doing a project with them, we'll go out and survey all the sewer that's going in in that project, and we'll update that model. So Rob could be in his office, David could be in his, I could be in mine, or anybody else that wanted access to it could, and we'd have that kind of a project management tool and overall live GIS. So, so people could figure out where their connections are. So, so we lost. could figure out, right. <laughs> yep. And that's where those two line items are. Um, there was an increase for new equipment. Uh, we, we have a two, I think it's a 2005 Ford Ranger that's just, it's time. Uh, mm. It's well, given us well worth its value, but uh, we need to replace that. Also, there was an increase in, uh, almost double the increase in our uh, professional or uh, protective equipment for the guys, safety equipment. Uh, as you know, Department of Labor Services was down over the summer and inspected every department. Uh, we were able to take the list of recommendations and requirements, and we've already met all those. Uh, the one last little bit is a little bit more of our, our safety equipment as far as, we all have hard hats and vests, but. In this type of weather, it would be nice if we had maybe a thicker jacket or coveralls that have the reflective material on it. So when they're out in the road, they're protected. Could you speak to the uh, Water Commission Reserve Fund, which- Yes, um, I was getting to that. So we oh, took- Oh, okay, sorry about that. Yep, we, we worked over the last six, seven months on creating that fund and a policy that, that hopes, the goal of the policy would be 5% of the budget into the uh, Commissioner Reserve Fund. That fund could be used for, uh, you know, unexpected things that happen. Uh, say, like if our large tap machine, if we're making a fire services are becoming a very big thing. I don't know if there was a change in insurance policies, but uh, we have a lot of them to do this winter, and we have one large tap machine that can do that. Say that tap machine broke, it's a forty, forty-five, fifty thousand dollar replacement item. The reserve fund could be used for that. The reserve fund could also be used, as, as it is this year, uh, taking towards capital projects instead of going getting financing using that fund to do that. So is that a rules-based um, reserve fund? Do you have, does the commission come up with a set of rules on how it's going to be utilized, or is it just uh, sort of as we're still, loose as you just described We're it? still working on all the, the stringent rules. And there is going to be a set of rules, yeah. yes. So I think the, go ahead, and anybody want to? Uh, yeah, just, is it going to be capped? I mean, is, we usually do our reserve funded at what, five? It's, a, it's 5% right now. So for, for this budget, it's at $300,000. Right. So if you don't use it next year, you just don't fund it if it's full, that's what I'm trying to say. We hadn't discussed that yet. Oh, okay. So one of the issues, and it, this is a perennial issue, and you probably know the questions I'm going to ask. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Your revenue exceeds your expenses. So, you know, you're running a, I mean, literally every year, uh, I would call it a, a margin of 20 to 25 percent. So, you know, even though your budget number, you've got a plug number, which called other there's never been a history of your expenses ever equaling your revenue. Mm -hmm. um, leading us to have maybe not direct conversation, but it certainly appears, and with retained earnings of $3 million, 
which is 50% of your revenue right now. Um, on the one hand, it, I mean, it just looks like the rates are too high. That that what the for a, a public utility, um, it just seems as though I mean it's not a private utility. It hasn't been a private utility for a while. If in fact you had to take this set of facts to a utility commission, you would see your rate scale back. I would suspect fairly significantly. So that's on the one hand. Yep. Uh, I personally am conflicted because if you drop the rates, you encourage more water use. So I'm I'm not quite sure how to reconcile in my own mind those issues. But in point of fact, I mean, we're running, uh, I mean, you've got a great business here, but we're a municipal entity. And so the question is, should we be, you know, should you and should we as a town be charging rate payers at, at this level? Um, and I don't know whether the commission's grappled with that question. They have, question. And, and we actually uh, we looked into what normal policies and, and guidance is from American Water Works. Uh, and for us, they like you to have at least, at least at a minimum, one full year's budget covered in retained earnings. That's how everyone's operating. So cash plans. on hand yes, of so $6 million. It would, be, it would be six million bucks. If we followed the guidelines from American Water Works to the best of our ability, that's what it would be. Okay. And, I, I, and that's just the guideline. That's, I'm not I'd, I'd be keen on control. seeing that because I, I, I haven't seen right. those kinds of metrics from other no, financial I, I know, entities. But I, I, I mean, I, you know, look, I think it's a, it's a legitimate you know, it's a oh, legitimate question to ask yeah. and for the commission to do some, you know, some homework or good work on this yeah. so that, that, uh, and the commission, the commission just feels, you know, that the, the $3 million to $4 million range is fiscally, fiscally responsible to have. If so, are they adopting a policy that would cap retained earnings at, let's say, where it is today, $3 million? We have talked about that at the last meeting and we're trying to get to that point. We're waiting for the rate study to be done. And then we can work with that and use that tool to help us with this, to finalize this. I don't know. How do other people feel about? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think uh, the overall water companies, you know, between technology and I mean, the amount of staffing that they have had in, in 20 years has the staffing increased by two people. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I, I mean, the retained earnings has gone towards capital. So instead of saying. I know it's money and it piles up and piles up and then all of a sudden we build a building or we do fire uh, hydrants or something like that. So, I mean, I think it would be great to get those metrics of what should be. But I'd hate to fall short, you know. I don't want to be a... Because uh, obviously the general fund's responsible in the end. So I'd rather have more Is money. GCA, uh, are they going to be looking at and suggesting some guidelines as part yes. of their work? Yes. So as part of this whole rate study, they looked at... Uh, a bunch of communities are same size, same type of pumping equipment, type of pipe, miles of pipe, and they're making comparison with those and they're getting information on those. Yeah. It's all part of the rate study. And so I know this has been a long running rate has. study it, for it almost was, 24 months. Are they going to be done this <laughs> they, winter? I, I was told two to three weeks today. <laughs> Jim, on some sort of performance schedule where they don't get paid? Uh, no. Declining it, it, balance of it, their it partly, fees? It's, and part of it's, part of it's me. Um, every time we develop something and they come up with another thing we can do with it, I want to add to the project to get us to the point where it can turn into an asset management tool as well. So there was a lot of information that needed to be gathered about our system that slowed it down in the yep. beginning. I mean, we worry, probably run about 10 or 12% on retained earnings for the, or I should say free cash for the town. We're running a 20% profit margin on this business. Mm -hmm. I mean, for and year, year over year over year. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a, I mean, a it's, it's not just one right. year. No. But it's gone to capital, so we haven't had well, to take the capital out of the general it fund. It hasn't. We've been borrowing money. Right. We also borrowed we money. We don't put, that's part of the problem. I mean, we didn't, how much did we put into the new building? Yeah. On, the, a, on a base of seven? I thought it was five. Five? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we put in 25, 20%. Yeah. 
25 percent so you so you're saying so i'm saying that we we build up retained earnings yep. and then we end up doing an awful lot of debt financing on top of that so well i think the question we asked last year was what was the number that we yeah. would feel comfortable with capping retained earnings, earnings at. at and i'm not sure we have right now it's I, five look five percent uh, well, that's, no, that's, it isn't. That's a different thing. That's a right, different that's thing. A different that's thing. a reserve number. Right. right. That's a reserve. I'm, the... I'm, I'm not sure why we need the reserve fund if the goal is to build up the retained earnings right. to one full year or 80 percent or some number that hasn't yeah. been determined. Why do we need this second mechanism to artificially inflate the expense line? But it's not artificially inflating any expense well, it's, line. It's, it, it's just creating an extra expense when the goal that I think you just said a couple of times is to uh, build up your retained earnings to a full year or as close as you can get to. It. No, I, that's the guy. That's the guidance documents. Okay, the commission's so, goal is right around that three to four million. Okay, three to four million dollars, and then in addition, we'd like uh, a you called it a commission reserve fund. Yes. Of five percent of each year's annual budget with no cap with no cap as to how much money will eventually accrue in that reserve fund. So how does that Correct, square? But we would, how does it, that square with the three to four million that you want in the reserve? Uh, in, because in we would earnings? be using that for projects like we're doing this year. But why can't it just go in the regular budget then? I mean, it's kind of like putting some money in the freezer and then having some under the mattress, right? You can't, <laughs> why do both? I don't, that doesn't make any sense. In the following, no, I, I think they I, save up and they and they have they have uh, things like for fire hydrants or the meters or whatever it is. I think of some cost on why we're. Well, so I we have well, three well, million in retained earnings right now. We're going to take out the two twenty five. Yeah, but not really. I mean, because you've you've budgeted again uh, with expense numbers that you've never reached. I reached. mean, you're you're budgeting a loss of sixty thousand dollars when your three year average is 1.27 million dollars surplus yeah. you know like it's and that includes setting aside three hundred thousand dollars in the reserve fund so you've got the three hundred thousand dollars in the reserve fund and then if averages hold another nine hundred thousand dollars going into the retained earnings which is 1.2 i mean so why don't we just <laughs> you know, say that those are what the numbers are. So let's, I think we need to separate some of these into two distinct discussions, okay? One of the discussions is with the Water Commission is the appropriate level of retained earnings. The second is the reserve amount that they have in their expenditure budget because that doesn't, they can't, at the end of the year, if they didn't use it, it would go into retained earnings and everyone needs to remember that retained earnings can only be used by a vote of town meeting once they're certified. They, they can't just spend out of retained earnings in, okay. in an emergency. It takes a vote of town meeting to transfer and appropriate retained earnings for whatever lawful purposes that can be used for. So they're building it up. They're potentially building retain that, that reserve into something that requires town meeting action to use, okay? The reserve fund within their budget enables them that 300,000 enables them if they ran into an emergency that of a large scale that would allow them to have the flexibility to manage it on an instantaneous basis and then and, and take care of it. So it's kind of they can't have a separate reserve we, they are building it into their budget unlike us who's actually voted at town meeting separately. Mm -hmm. So on its so own the budget. reserve fund doesn't accrue from year to year. It does not accrue. Anything okay. unspent in their budget goes into retained earnings. So in a in a theoretical basis, it accrues, but it's not this separate fund that's just going to continue to, to grow right. and so, grow and grow. So we're not growing a reserve fund and retaining No, you're earnings. not. You're at, no, it's okay. okay. <clears throat> if, if the reserve fund is basically like any expenditure line in their budget, okay, at the end of the year, when we close everything together, that money get would be certified as retained earnings. And in a year, if revenues don't come in as high as the budget and there's expenditures a little bit higher but not over revenues retained earnings may not be at three million dollars they may be at 2.5 million dollars it's 
completely dependent on a whole a range of factors, but there's not two separate funds accruing on an annual basis by doing this. Okay, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. Cause so the fund that they're setting aside is money they can spend with, with without permission, and the retained earnings they have to have permission for. Retained earnings has to be appropriated by town meeting, yep. a town, town meeting, special town meeting, any legislative meeting like that to be able to be used. It okay. cannot just be spent by the Water Commission for an without appropriation by a town meeting. Okay. Okay. Does that help, I hope? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I still help. think, though, we've, we've still got the same issue, which is that expenses are expenses are considerably lower than revenues and have been year over year over year, and yet we see budget, budgets every year that balance expenses and revenues, and it's, and it's a fiction. So... You know, I think that where we've finally gotten to as a committee is let's do away. I mean, we're if sound fiscal po management says build a retained earnings pool of $3 million or whatever the numbers are, let's do it. Let's call it that. Let's not hide that under this, which it basically, I mean, you've, you, do, you do a great job of managing on the expense side. Revenues, to some extent, are out of your control other than setting the rates. Right. They're, they're a function of, of, of demand. But, you know, we, every year we look at the same thing that says everything's balanced, and then we have the, the other line down at the bottom, which fills out, uh, I mean, it's a plug factor to get up to the, the revenue number. And I think that there's a desire to just... Um, and I know I speak for some of the members that aren't here, a desire to just, you know, let's be honest and straightforward uh, about it. And, and the commission should have a policy, and it should be understood, and it should be based on some th sound thinking. And, mm -hmm. and then let's just budget it and run it that way. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess that's where, you know, where I would like to see us. And if that means cutting back on your revenue projection, and if you run over your revenue, it's going to fall to retained earnings. But I, you know, how do, how do, how do we, Brian? I'm looking at you because I, um, you know, basically, how do we get this so that we see a real relationship between, and 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 not a a continuation of what's been going on for the past, you know, few years. Which I'm not saying is a is a bad thing. I think perhaps rates are a little bit too high, but you know, if you're trying to build a reserve and, or a retained earnings reserve, then maybe it's appropriate. Um, I think that, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I mean, if the concern is about the reserve, which in the committee or the FinCom didn't want it, then if it was going to be a recommendation to remove it, we would just reduce revenue down by that number. Um, we can't... We're not supposed to go to DOR with an unbalanced budget when we go to set the tax rate. So um, if we were going to reduce revenues down, then the only other funding source to fund an expenditure budget, unless there was going to be changes, would be to draw more against retained earnings. That would be the only way to accomplish what you're discussing. So if the expenditure side, and just as an example, was okay, but you wanted to reduce revenues, then we would reduce them, but we'd have to get an authorization to make up that shortfall by getting to dipping into retained earnings to cover it, and then, um, because I do have to have a balanced budget in terms of this. Um, otherwise, DOR is going to make me raise any shortfall on the recap to close it. So, and that's not a scenario that I would like to go down, or a road I would like to go down. I, I think the, I mean, the issue, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the whole conversation, is year over year, they make money. Great. And year over year, we see a budget that loses money as the proposed next year budget, and it never comes true. But it's actually not, pro it's not proposing to lose money because it's, 60, it, it's actually, there's a deficit on that page of $225,000 for the two items that they're paying for out of retained earnings. On the summary sheet, it has a zero-based budget because we transfer the money in, those things will be funded by their retained earnings. So, But I'm guessing next year this time, we're going to find out that this year's number will turn out to be much more positive than it probably showed before. And that's, I think it's that's a, the, I, the, the, the 
Gotcha. It's yes, it's a distinct possibility. I, I'm not going <laughs> to six five months before the end I of the year <laughs> promise you that this is what's going to happen. No, it's I mean, just it, it's, I, it's, I understand what the you know I, I do understand, but I'm my my responsibility to you is to tell you what would happen if we made changes and how we would manage okay. them. Um, the, I mean, one possibility would be to increase the commission's reserve fund to seven and a half percent. Okay, and it, just to prevent. I mean, I, I don't think anybody thinks the likelihood we're not going to achieve pretty close to this revenue number. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think that's very much at risk. I don't tell me something, you know, I, I mean, OK, so I don't I don't think you're going to have to go hat in hand to D.O.R. to say, oh, we really screwed this one up. Um, and <laughs> and if that is, in fact, your concern, then maybe we increase the you know, maybe we. I mean, there's an opportunity. I mean, I haven't had a chance to discuss this exactly with Mark and Heidi, so they may be hearing this for the first time as well. But the reality is this, okay? If the reserve is the, the concern or whatever for the committee, okay, I can have further discussions with Mark and Heidi about this, but we could remove it. If they had an emergency, as long as they had funding in other lines of their budget, we could cover that emergency in the short term and at the next annual town meeting we could transfer in if they were going to be in a deficit. We could transfer retained earnings after they've been certified in to cover that one-time issue that happens. So there is there could be a way to do it, but I'd want to have more conversations with not only Mark and Heidi, but the Water Commission before I told you that that was an absolute possibility. But we've done it. I mean, we've done it. We've done it with other, and we've done it when we have yeah. the, the other I'm issues. I'm not sure. So I can, think it that's can be issue. accomplished. <laughs> But it's certainly something that should be discussed with everyone. Else. I'm not sure that it's the water commissioner reserve fund on that's the line the item. No, you know, that's, that's the, the issue. issue. No. Okay. The issue is <laughs> that um, actuals for 18 were 1,257,000 going to retained earnings. So in my life, that's pure profit. Not a problem. Don't not complaining about it. <laughs> In fact, I'd like to be in the business. That makes that much extra. However, <laughs> if I was, I'd be in front of the PUC, and my returns would be on my capital invested, and they would be considerably lower. And I just, I would like to see an honest accounting to the ratepayers of exactly what it's costing to run the water business, recognizing it's a municipal service. And that we're not here to make 20 or 25 percent profit margins. I mean, if it's a private company, it's a it's a very different situation. At the same time, we don't want to jeopardize, you know, the infrastructure and the franchise. So that's why having a decent set of of uh, policies from the commission as to what is going to get accumulated, so that if in fact we start to go over those numbers, that you know, maybe there is a decision to reduce the rates or to cut back on on others. I notice you want to increase the connection fees. Um, you know, so that's kind of what, and it all, I mean, my sense is that when the rates were set the last time, and I'm not sure how, I know you weren't in charge uh, then, and so I don't know how much, uh, um, how much outside help went into setting those rates, but it looks like, you know, the commission overshot on the rates. I mean, the rates are, you know, went up pretty dramatically, and revenue is has really skyrocketed. And you know, there's expenses have stayed pretty much, um, you know, pretty much where they are. So, is there a reason why that there's not an active consideration of reducing the rates since you sort of met your reserve on the retained earnings? Well, we have the three in there, and that's what the commission wants. Right. And then, as Brian stated, we need something in there in case something happens. If so that's the three hundred thousand. Three hundred. Got it. And we are starting to use more retained earnings towards capital. But by the end of this budget cycle, you'll have another one point something million dollars. So at some point, the rate thing has to be considered. Isn't why we're, we're waiting for the study, though? I mean, what seems like all the these rate, programs rate that are going totally on are going to come to, to, to together. In three weeks' Hopefully. time when it's done. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the third year we're discussing this. Uh, Anyway. Um, okay. I don't know what, what, I mean, I'd certainly, uh, who's, who's your chair, commission chair? Alan. Alan. 
So he, I know he's in another meeting right now. So. He couldn't. He he really he was going to try to be yeah, here tonight. Yeah, but. I know he's somewhere else. Um, I guess um, if we can schedule it, I'd like to ha hear from your commission on where they're going to go. Okay. On this, I appreciate all the work you and Heidi have done to put the budget together. So mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a. You know, we don't have an issue with oh, where totally you guys are, are at <laughs> on this. You're, you're doing a great job. Runs really well. It's yeah, just, I mean, you're doing a great job running yeah. the business. It's yeah. just about the transparency of the numbers and understanding how, yeah. you know, how to protect for that rainy day is not the right word. We, we, <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. That's, that's all. I mean, there hasn't been a bad budget in my time on this board. I mean, yeah. you know every all the actuals come back better which is which is great news it's just about how do we get some clarity and still get the commission and and you know want to comment what it wants which is to build its retained earnings right you know to see that policy to codify that policy and then build a budget around it while still satisfying i don't understand how the american waterworks association or whatever that name is yeah. Uh, can suggest that sound fiscal policy is one year's um, operating budget as retained earnings, and then DOR requires uh, a balanced budget. But such is life, you know. If yeah, that's I'm not sure either. Do, I that's, know for an example, that's the needle we need to thread. I guess. The town of Drake has over 10 million, and they're about the same size as us. Yeah, yeah I, so I don't again, know where the guidance you know, comes from. I don't know when when it started. Um, you know, maybe this commission reserve fund is the answer. You know, maybe that's where we can budget okay. for, uh, you know, the the profit, so to speak. And then, you know, if 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 you need to use it in the year, you use it in the year, and nothing falls to retained earnings. I don't know uh, the exact answer, but that might get us closer to okay. all the other lines being close to equal. But, but we can set up a meeting for sure. Yeah, I'll if you would communicate with Alan, I'd appreciate I it. Will, I will also definitely. send him a note just yep. saying. Yep. And we'll schedule something. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, anything else? No, good job. Yeah, yeah, good job. Heidi, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you, Mark. Mark, thank you. Uh, Sconset, next. Yep. Flip, flip side of the story. Sconset, on the other hand, is going the other way. Um, about a year and a half ago, I think, Brian and his team down at Finance had noticed, and we had noticed, there's a drop in water use in Sconset. Uh, for this year's budget, we're showing an 8% decrease in uh, revenue brought in. And it's just based off water flows have been slowly decreasing in Sconset. I think it's a combination of uh, people being smarter with water. The rate is much higher in Sconset, so they're probably paying a little bit more attention. Uh, technology and the rain sensors is better. and. Every time somebody remodels a house and the appliances are updated, um, we end up with, you know, water conservation. But we did decrease the revenues in Sconset. Um, we did not plan for any new capital in Sconset for this year and no rate changes. Uh, we already have a capital that was approved a couple of years ago for Baxter Road. Uh, as we all know, we're the town's got to decide on what we want to do on Baxter Road, so we held off on putting that new water main in and replacing that water main until it's determined if it's really going to go in that road or if it's going to go out on Sankety Road and, or somewhere else. Um, Sconset has only got about 840 customers, so uh, the last rate change in Sconset was in 2010, and that was to help cover the debt service for the new water tower that had to go up uh, the inspectors went up on the old black tower that was there and condemned it on site when they got to the ground. So something had to be done right away. Uh, there is some potential future revenue for Sconset uh, coming from uh, the, the subdivision out there that is not underway yet, but on Canterbury there's, a, I think, a 38 or 39 lot subdivision. Uh, I'm not sure when it's going to start. And also will be... Uh, the cell phone companies right now are currently putting uh, bid packages together for putting more equipment on on the, all the water towers, actually. So that'll be another stream in the future for, for revenue for Sconset. 
but for the most part, it's kind of staying still. Uh, we're working with National Grid a little bit for both Wanakamata and Sconset to uh, try to find better ways to pump in off-peak hours to save some money there. And that, that's pretty much it for Sconset. Would you, um, on your line items uh, related to uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield premiums and retirement funds. I think the number on your budget <coughs> between the two is about sixty some odd thousand. Who's that covering? Jerry, Jerry Eldridge. Okay, so we we um, and, and Jimmy Charns as well. Okay, there's two retirees. For two retirees. All right. And we still pay into their retirement fund. I'm not sure about that. With Barnstable. Um, so it doesn't, we're, we're, our obligation doesn't end when they retire? No. No, because the, you know, um, we get them because it's a because pay as you go. So there's two pieces to the, there's the, we have, uh, because they're retirees and any retirees, they're eligible for health insurance. So Sconset right. has to cover that. And yep. we still get an assessment from Barnstable County because they're, we're still funding the unfunded portion of the pension obligation, which was from years ago when the pension just paid out and didn't okay. take enough in. So that's why they're still, once okay. that funding schedule is completed, it would be my expectation that would go away. Yep. And that's in 2048. 38? Pretty close, 2038. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Let's see your Brady retires. <laughs> and then uh, just the other quick question. I don't want to belabor this, but our, our insurance premiums went up for building insurance. So uh, there's a $40,000 line item this year. There's never been a line item. I assume it's for GCL or property liability or something. It's account 57404. Don't worry about it. We've never carried it before until this year. Heidi knows what it is. So it's ta for the tank? Yes. Okay. That's the main yep. Piece. All right. Thanks. No more questions for me. Great. Thanks Good. very much. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. I'll uh, do my best to answer any detailed questions, but my team had to leave we had a pipe burst in Jamie's office and basically wiped out her office so right. but you there. have a reserve Clean fund right five <laughs> percent <laughs> that sounds like insurance, insurance. <laughs> <laughs> um, good news is our revenues are up about eight hundred and some thousand dollars that's driven primarily by increased land rentals as well as uh, CPI and fair market value adjustments our expenses are down slightly about fifty fifty four thousand dollars and a lot of that is just basically um, finally getting some history and knowledge and putting the line items where they belong and some discipline there. The great news for me is it's the first budget I get to present where we don't have any reliance on retained earnings. Um, we are transferring in $400,000 from our PFC fund, though, and that would be a course of normal action going forward anyway. Um, so we're, we're doing okay. We have a certified retained earnings they were at 2.1 million we still have some money in the fuel revolver and we also have a stabilization fund the expenses uh, the main drivers there one of the big ones is the airfield maintenance and repair uh, as you may know we have a capital request in for a taxiway it's about a 19 million dollar job that taxiway is literally crumbling we had to do a couple of patches last year one was 10,000 one was 80,000 um, so we increased the line item for maintenance, and we're going to town meeting for a request for appropriation for the taxiway. The other major capital item that we have at town meeting is the um, 
security project and we are awaiting a decision on whether or not we'll be getting a discretionary grant but they're on hold due to the uh, federal government shutdown unfortunately and uh, one other note for uh, town meeting we're going to request some uh, modification to the language for our fuel revolver to allow us to use the money to also do repairs and maintenance to the fuel farm because we have some significant uh, upgrades that need to be done there I'll be glad to try and answer any questions you have. So on, um, are any of your capital expenses not being recommended? Uh, no. They've so all they're all being recommended all the, by yeah, the capital Cap county? Capcom, the same recommendation. Everything like okay. And um, you mentioned um, on the changes year over year, increase in seasonal traffic. Is that private or commercial? Commercial, primarily. Uh, we're seeing a slight bump in the fuel on the um, corporate side, but the commercial side is growing rapidly. We are going to have uh, 10 jet blue flights a day on peak days this coming summer. And on our peak Saturdays, I counted up to 20 flights possible, and that's without Cape Air and Retrix. So that drives your passenger facility charge. How about uh, your takeoffs and landings? Are uh, they increasing? Yes, we just, as a matter of fact, just uh, recently the commission uh, approved the change in our rates and charges to increase uh, landing fees as well as some other ramp fees to, we're, we're starting to get to a more of a cost center and cost uh, recovery uh, basis. So we have set, assigned some of the costs that are associated with the expansion, the temporary hold room to the carriers. Um, so they'll they'll be increasing, or they I forget the effective date. I think it might be February one. If you have a uh, significant increase in JetBlue landings, and you just said the runway is the, needing significant repair, is there a contradiction here? The the taxiway is. Um, oh, the taxiway. It, it's a. It's a contradiction, but it's a cause and effect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> part of the reason the taxiway is uh, crumbling is because one age, it's about 35 years old, okay. but secondly, larger aircraft with higher operations. And JetBlue is planning to increase the size of the airplane in 2020. Okay. They're coming in with newer airplanes. Um, so that's why it's critical we get it done. Okay. Um, and we're fighting to try to get discretionary money, which means we compete with the rest of the country. Um, there was a question, and you may hear discussion about this, in Martha's Vineyard, they just, uh, they're redoing their main runway, and it's only $12 million, and they're saying, well, why is a taxiway costing 19 A number of reasons. One, uh, our taxiway is 500 feet longer. Two, we have to do full depth reconstruction. The sub base, everything has to be replaced. And three, there's a major section of the taxiway that has to be elevated about three feet or so because it's lower than the runway. Okay, thank you. When it comes to raising um, more revenue, um, and we just talked about the rates for the water company, do, do we do we try to correlate, you know, I know the answer can't be all the time just to keep raising rates, raising rates until we raise rates and put ourselves out of business. I mean, do we, do we go with a percentage? Do we have models also we, we actually use. try to go with like I say cost recovery mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to, we're predominantly what's known as a compensatory rate making methodology but we're starting to introduce some of the um, compen yeah not compensatory, compensatory. We, we are compensatory we're trying to go with some of the residual which would mean where we take a, a specific cost center and you would uh, just split it up let's say prorate it based on number of passengers or landed weight or whatever so that we have to, we can't just randomly assess uh, fees. We have to have an established methodology and the carriers have a right to input into that. They also have a formal right to file complaints against us to the FAA. We did have a um, small operator file a complaint against us. It's called a part 13 and we prevailed uh, because we established the, the methodology we did. <coughs> So, um, gosh, I re remember probably back when you started and we were talking about where do we find revenue, and one of the things we talked about was rental income, and, and uh, you guys are to be applauded. I mean, your rev rental revenue is up almost 40%, so, or your, at least that's what you're budgeting, I assume. 
that's that's yeah, pretty locked in. Yeah, um, and that's that's part of the revenue diversification that we're trying to yeah. accomplish. Where that comes in month after month, it's not seasonal. So, and you looks like somebody figured out you could advertise and charge. So, well, we can advertise and do it in house, and we have a a great person, uh, Katie Perales, who's mm -hmm. doing an amazing job with that. Um, parking lot fees are declining. Is is that a uh, just less people parking, or you're not priced correctly, so you're driving people it's, to park off it's, site, or it's three factors: less people are parking. You have the Uber effect as well okay. as the island effect because so small. But the main driver is we uh, converted from operating it ourselves to a management agreement. So what we're realizing is uh, time savings in our staff not having to put time into that. Uh, so it's, it doesn't come out to a dollar, dollar wash. Okay, that's fair. And uh, your fuel sales, are these numbers costs, uh, net of cost of goods sold, or are they um, your actuals in 18, your budget in 19 is a little lower, your budget in 20 is the same as 19? Brian, would you know the answer to that question? Yeah, the expense should be cost of goods in there. It's net of or not? And the actuals. And the actuals. Uh, it's net net. Because we're well, no, because no, it's on full. Are you talking? Are you talking uh, line forty two, four fifty one? Yeah, and four fifty two. That's the actual transfer above and beyond what was authorized in the fuel revolver. So oh, okay. It's, so it's it rolls pure, over to an operator. Okay, so it's really not fuel sales. Not fuel sales. That's what it's called. Okay. Unless we went over that cap. Gotcha. And then that sale was only. Everybody following what's happening there? Yeah. Okay. Well, and uh, your passenger facility charge program has been working out pretty well for you? It is. We're in the process. We're going to be starting uh, another application. Uh, the one we have doesn't expire for a year or two. However, you never want them to lapse because then you have to begin the process all over again. So we're, we're going to uh, proceed with another amendment, essentially. Mm -hmm. And again, with the new JetBlue flights, we should realize some additional income there. But because of some DOR regulations, we can't until we actually realize it. It's, we can't put it in as a projection. So. Anybody else? I don't want to. Yeah, I know. Are we? Are we? Uh, we talk about more flights with JetBlue, and then we we look at the um, capacity of uh, the TSA and the rest of it. Are we, are we are we meeting the challenges of trying to move all those people? And I know we have tents outside now, and that's what we're gonna we're gonna have it. We're gonna have tent phase two this summer. Okay, it's two tents, um, a large one for JetBlue and another one for American, but a, a whole different look. And we received, um, I believe, it was four hundred thirty thousand dollars from the state. Uh, and an ASMP grant for that as well. <coughs> we are looking at a, a terminal master plan, terminal area plan, to address screening and a number of items, but we're, we're getting to a point where we're, we're limited. Right. On our, go ahead. I was gonna say, with the increase in JetBlue flights, do you have a rough head count of how many more people it's gonna be? Yeah, that's where a guy like Noah could tell you almost exactly. Sure. I believe it's about a 14% increase, and we rec we were up 14% over last year. Okay. So it's another 14 probably. On your service and maintenance, um, your 18 increase to your 20 budget is about, f it's over 50%. Are we, are we now on a trajectory where our maintenance costs are starting to increase significantly related to our building um i mean it, I'm you know but after this pipe burst yes <laughs> um i don't think we're on a trajectory i think again it's it's driven primarily by the infrastructure <coughs> and that taxiway uh, we are behind an infrastructure and once we do the taxiway you're going to start seeing repairs <coughs> on the, the apron that's going to be necessary 
You're talking about overall maintenance repair. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking. You have a category here which actually looks more like their buildings and not main, not the taxiway. I mean, it's things for vehicles, building, equipment, grounds. Some of that is um, we just took over 12 T-hangers, a bank of T-hangers that we now own. Uh, so there's something, there's some money is in there for that. But again, there's an offsetting revenue as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, we're very conservative on what we budgeted for the revenue on that, uh, the T hangers. Um, any other? Nope. Well, you guys have come. You guys have come a long way. I hope we don't have a downturn. Uh, so I'm well, sure you don't. Trust either. me, we are. Uh, we're looking at Plan B just in case, but. David, I remember distinctly when you were telling us about retained earnings and how we shouldn't be relying on them. So this is goal number one. The next goal is a much bigger one, and that's going to be to be self-sufficient without the fuel. But um, we do have some other land we're still looking at. We have interested parties, so it's something I'm going to be working with you on when Katie's out. Wow. Good job. Good job. Thanks. I'm going to go see how bad the damage is. There you go. Tom, thanks very much. Thanks, your, thanks to your team as well. Um, please extend that to them. Appreciate it. Yeah, very good. Poor Jamie, I think, is a wreck. Everything was on her desk, is gone, her computer's went too long. Oh, yeah. God. Next door, maybe. Oh, no. Terrible. All right, you can't leave yet. I have to go pick up my kid. You have three minutes <laughs> before he gets booted. All right, so we have a, we have a county budget. Um, Oh, that's Brian's job. <laughs> I can probably do it in less than three minutes, I okay. imagine. Mm -hmm. and, I and I have one other thing beyond that, some dates. So do it in two minutes, please, okay. unless oh. there's questions. <clears throat> okay, so the county budget supports county administration, uh, registry of deeds being deeds excise, and uh, red, uh, administration. The funding sources are the town assessment, deeds excise revenue, recording fees, Correction to deeds excise, which is related to the public safety facility and a $250,000 payment towards the debt service on that. And either registry of deeds excise fund balance, which can only be used in certain circumstances to support the registry. And then the county fund balance, which would support county operations if we needed to um, allocate any funding from that. We are not proposing allocating funding from any fund balance. Projected revenue is if all goes according to plan, it would be $1,037,000. Town assessment is $170,201. Deeds excise receipts made up of county is $446,250. Recording fees of $171,500 and the $250,000 I mentioned for deeds excise for, from corrections. <clears throat> county funding requirement, which is our $170,201 assessment. By law, we must provide a certain amount of non-deeds excise revenue to the registry. That amount increases by 2.5%. The funding requirement in total is $329,381. When you subtract out the 178.5 from the other page, we get approximately 157000 which would be what the, count, the town has to um, budget for to the county. We've kept it at the same 170, which is consistent with the, since I've been here. Projected expenses are $975,211. <coughs> County administration is primarily made up of legal and professional services. There are no employees that are paid through county administration. All employees in, within the county are funded through registry of deeds. There are three full-time employees within registry of deeds. <coughs> and we're proposing $466,247 budget for them. And then the $250,000 worth of the debt service contribution from the the county to the town for this facility. <clears throat> On the last page, we just show a comparison between last year's budget, which was approved at $1,003,608 versus 975,211 this year. The main reduction is that the um, Registrar of Deeds had added some special projects money, or potentially hiring some short-term temporary people to work on some projects, which they're not going to continue with or do this year. So the main that's the main reduction in the in the in the budget. So I assume they're carrying an open position? Uh, no, there's no no new or vague. There is a position I think that has been in there but has never been funded in the five years that I've been okay. here. Um, 
is there any risk if real estate sales fall off a cliff? I would probably say there's always risk of real estate sales falling off. I think that, um, I think if it were, it would be near the end, well, it'd be halfway through the year, which um, we would potentially have to find a way to, to close that gap. But I think it's something that we could manage in, in, in within the county, yes. Just four minutes. Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Blame him, not me. I just texted him. I'm, I'm okay. on my way. <laughs> one, final, one final thing as you're packing up. Thanks, um, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Do we, is there any preference on doing some dates to bring some folks back in and who do we want specifically on the citizen articles? Tobias wants to come in. Uh, I think there's something on one of the uh, Steve Cohen, specifically the Madiket in Madiket at the appropriation of a, of a, a roadway that uh, abandonment of a roadway. Um, who else? Tobias? No, did I we said take Tobias. action on any of Tobias's, but I guess it doesn't We did. We took we... action on one of them, which was the $100,000. Not to fund the study. To fund the study. We said. No. No. Right. Okay. Um, but he wants to come in. He wants to come in generally to speak about yeah. any and everything. Yeah. Any, anything else? Are we going to have the government study committee come in, or are they going to give us an answer on their findings? To do. I think. I don't think they're really here. No. Um, who went? Uh, I think Joe Gross. Joe is going to be the point human on that. Yeah, and uh, I'll Report wait. I know that. Joe's. I know Joe spoke with pressure, so I'll wait for Joe to come. Joe's uh, in New York this uh, this week, so. All right. How about um, the swimming pools? Is oh right. Fritz gonna come in and that? Fritz is going to come in. Yeah. All right, so I can just go ahead and schedule those. I apologize. We're all screwed up in terms of our normal dates that a lot of this stuff was going on. We're really, the town's not done. Capcom's not, well, they'll be done tomorrow. School's at least a week behind. I mean, we're really up. So we have a meeting next Tuesday, the 28th at 4. Don't we have a joint meeting we have tomorrow? A joint, we have a joint oh, meeting tomorrow. We have Saturday. And we have, we have Saturday. Saturday. So and we have Monday, oh, and in the yes, past Monday. we've canceled that, but I'm going to keep it open. Okay. So, so we haven't worked that hard in January, so anyway. It's okay. Okay? okay. Thank you very much. Joanna, is there anything As, else? you're not on contract review committee. That really seems <laughs> quite strenuous. That's it for me. This okay, can I have a motion strenuous. to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, thank Aye. you very much. Have a nice evening.